Well, if not, then let's open in prayer, shall we? Our Father, we thank you for this time that we have to open the scriptures, to learn from them, and to be edified by them. We thank you for this really excellent study that we've been going through with Mike in the book of 1 Samuel, the story of David, even after he was uh, anointed as king by Samuel, he's still on the run from Saul, who uh, is after him. And so we pray that your word would encourage us as well as motivate us to live lives that are in keeping with the trust that both David and Jonathan had in the sovereign workings of our great God. We ask this in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. We're going to look at a passage this morning. Uh, it is 1 Samuel, so turn there, there, 1 Samuel chapter 20, and we're going to look at verses 24 through 42. And just as a, a way of um, review, especially for anybody who wasn't here for the last uh, one or two lessons, uh, David is on the run from Saul. Saul has threatened his life. And his son, Jonathan, uh, is, is uh, aware of that. And so Jonathan has um, concocted a ruse, if you'd call it that, a way to let David know that uh, it, whether or not Saul is still tending to, intending to kill him. And he's, uh, his ruse is that he will go out into the, to the uh, area where David is hiding, and he'll take a young man with him, and he will shoot an arrow, and when he'll tell, and he'll tell the young man to go search for the arrows, and he said, if they're over here, if I tell him it's over this way, then that means Saul is not looking to put you to death, but if I tell him to go over this way, he is t uh, conspiring to kill you. So, anyway, we'll take up with uh, verse 20, or excuse me, 24 in chapter 20. So David hid in the field, and when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat food. And the king sat on his seat as usual, the seat by the wall. Then Jonathan rose up, and Abner sat down by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul did not speak anything that day, for he thought, it is an accident. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. And it came about the next day, the second day of the new moon, that David's place was empty once again. So Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why is the son of Jesse not come to the meal either yesterday or today? Jonathan then answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. For he said, please let me go since our family has a sacrifice in the city and my brother has commanded me to attend. And now if I have found favor in your sight, please let me get away that I may see my brothers. For this reason, he has not come to the king's table. Then Saul's anger burned against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you are choosing the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither now, uh, as long as Jesse lives on the earth, neither now send and bring him to me, for he must surely die. But Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said to him, why should he be put to death? What has he done? Then Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him down. So Jonathan knew that his father decided to put David to death. Then Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and did not eat food on the second day of the new moon, for he was grieved over David because his father had dishonored him. Now it came about in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field for the appointment with David, and a little lad was with him. And he said to his lad, run, find now the arrows which I'm about to shoot. As the lad was running, he shot an arrow past him. When the lad reached the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan called after the lad and said, is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan called after the lad, hurry, be quick, do not stay. And Jonathan's lad picked up the arrow and came to his master. But the lad was not aware of anything. Only Jonathan and David knew about the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to his lad and said to him, Go bring them to the city. When the lad was gone, David rose from the south side and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. 
and they kissed each other and wept together, but David more. And Jonathan said to David, go in safety inasmuch as we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord will be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. Then he rose and departed while Jonathan went into the city. Mike. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, what a privilege it is to be back at Believer's Chapel in the adult class and uh, to teach the scriptures. Uh, as we just read, we are at the New Moon Festival, and this is the 20th lesson in our study together of the rise of David. And he is a king, but he has no kingdom. So we are beginning here in verse 24 at the first day of the new moon festival. Saul sat at the table. Verse 25 specifically is called the wall seat. We would say against the wall. The wall seat is also known as the highest seat. And Jonathan stood in his place. Now, uh, you have uh, different versions that read different things here. Uh, Jonathan saw, sat opposite. Uh, more modern scholarship uh, has addressed this uh, difficult translation. And uh, they have they've come away with the best translation, I think, is the King James that says Jonathan arose rather than sitting opposite. But if we're going to talk about a difference in a translation uh, and what would seem to be such a minor point, we have to ask, is there any real significance to that? And actually there is. Uh, the context is, of course, the pledge that of covenant loyalty that David and Jonathan just made with one another. So now we take the translation and Jonathan arose. Here is Jonathan in faithfulness, in kindness to his father, giving him the respect that he is due. That, my friends, is righteousness. Uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse 7, paying to all what is owed to them, taxes to taxes, uh, revenue to revenue, respect to respect, honor to whom honor is due. That is righteousness. And therefore, we should extol Jonathan again for this exceptional behavior with this young man. Notice here is the figure of a new man in the story of David, Abner. He is Saul's first cousin. Do you have first cousins that you grew up with? Some of those relationships are very close. We had the first mention of Abner at the end of Chapter 17, the victory of David over Goliath. He is the commander and chief of the army. And we can assume that David would have reported directly to him. We can also assume that Abner knows what a formidable man this David is in weaponry and skill in battle. So we'll file Abner away for the time being. He will come back in the story. He will wash back up on the shore of the story of David seeking the kingdom for which he does not have now. Here's a final fact. David's seat was empty at this new moon festival. 
So the plan is underway that, thank you Warren for putting us in the proper context that they had discussed between David and Jonathan about how they would address the fact that David would be a no-show at this important three-day feast. In verse 26, this interesting uh, on the narrator, our historian by the power of the Spirit, he takes us into the mind of Saul. Now, I just want to do uh, an aside here. We believe that all Scripture is inspired and authoritative. It is God-breathed. So, our historian is delivering to us the facts, but God inspires him to actually see the facts and bring them out to us in a colorful or we might say a three-dimensional way. He wasn't there. He's not taking notes, but he is led and empowered by the Spirit of God to give us absolute and certain truth. So what Saul is thinking is inspired. Our historian is giving it to us. It is the mind of Saul. And here it is. He didn't say anything that day, for he thought. So here is his thinking. Not saying, but thinking. It's an accident that David is not clean. Now this is a feast in which would involve sacrifices. One had to be ceremonially clean in order to participate uh, under the law, the certain washings and cleanings. If one were to touch a dead animal, for example, he would remain unclean until the evening. Saul thought David had accidentally become unclean. That is the thinking from our historian. Now this is a three-day feast, and so we move from day one on into day number two with verse 27. David's place again was empty. And it is like they had written the script themselves, David and Jonathan. Saul says to Jonathan, his son, why didn't the son of Jesse come? Now, a very talented scholar who is not a Christian, but is a very adept man in the inspired language, Robert Alter, I have referenced him a number of times. He adds something that uh, no other commentator had really said. And here is the word that he uses. Uh, son of Jesse. This is a patronomic. That's what he called it. A patronomic response. Let me spell that because it was new to me. P-A-T-R-O-N-Y-M-I-C, patronomic response. That is a dismissive comment. Uh, you speak down to someone, for example. Uh, we would say, uh, here's President Ronald Reagan. Well, Ronnie is here among us. It's that type of an, an idea. Placing ourselves really above and speaking down to. And this would be his fashion. Uh, I bring that out because we're going to see it again in chapter 22 with Ahimelech the priest. And it all begins to fit together and form a manner, a means, a commentary, if you will, around Saul. This man is slowly and subtly changing. He is not the humble man that he once was 
early when the prophet Samuel said, you were at one time small in your own eyes. Now this is a man now who's beginning to feel his oats, so to speak. And he is changing. So this is a demissive way to refer to David. You know, he's, we, we are told that in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 9 that he kept a suspicious eye out for David, uh, 18, 9. Um, it could be that he was being surveilled or that he just paid a lot of attention to David his attitudes and actions. We just don't know uh, at this point in time. The writer doesn't let us in on that particular portion of his thought. Uh, so verses 28 and 29, now we have Jonathan speaking. And remember, Jonathan is like a believer. He is like the faithful Christian in the story all the time. And so he says, David eagerly asked of me to go to Bethlehem. And now notice Jonathan deviates from the story that they had uh, scripted out previously. He inserts his older brother, which would be Eliab, the oldest, and it could be that Jesse, the father, has now turned over the real estate, the property, the farm, to his eldest son, which would be in accordance with the law. So obeying his brother's command, Eliab, David would go back there. Now that, of course, is a lie. David is hiding in the field. But here is something else that could have triggered this outburst of Saul that we're going to see in a moment. This word, get away, uh, it's our familiar verb for this per period of time in David's life. Fled, meaning escaped. We had it in 1912, we had it in 1918, and now we have it in 20 and verse one, it could be that that verb, or the use of that verb to get away, is what triggered Saul. We don't know. The text doesn't tell us, but it's interesting to think about anyway. Here is now the outburst from Saul. Verse 30. The anger of Saul burned against Jonathan. Notice his full vent is on his son. Son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Disgrace of your mother's nakedness. Now, if you ever are addressed like that, you have just received a grade A tongue lashing from the ancient Near East, believe me. Mother's nakedness, rebellious woman, perversion. Goodness gracious. He lets Jonathan have it, and he lets him have it, not in privacy, but among all of the men sitting at the table. Well, David had set up the test he had framed the possible reactions back in verse 7. One was, he could have said, okay, regarding him being gone in Bethlehem, and the danger would have passed. But alas, that is not the situation. Here is actually what happened. The anger of Saul burned against Jonathan. This expression son of a perverse and rebellious woman, is not only directed at Jonathan, but Jonathan's own mother as well. It's a disgraceful comment. But I want you to think of the irony about it. He's 
He's not the son of a rebellious woman. He's the son of a rebellious father. That's who Jonathan is. I didn't say that. Samuel the prophet said that. Before our study began in the end of 1 Samuel 15, earlier in that chapter, when he had not killed Agag the king and wiped out all of the Amalekites as he was told to do, Samuel the prophet addresses his wickedness in a very important and quotable statement that's often used throughout the Old Testament and its teaching. 1 Samuel 22-23, you don't need to turn there. And here is the word of Samuel addressing Saul the king. Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. And here is the word, rebellion. That's you, Saul, rebellious. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, divination. And that's our word, 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 30. It's so easy to assign terms, words to other people, isn't it? You are rebellious. So easy to assign, but so hard to see it in your own self, isn't it? Easy to repeat disgrace and direct it to Jonathan, who is in every way measurable a better man than you, Saul. Cornelius Van Til, great Westminster theologian of a previous generation used a very famous illustration talking about the effects of sin upon the mind of men. And he says, men have rose-colored glasses cemented to their face, meaning they can't differentiate any other color but red. The world looks red to them and they cannot appreciate any other thought than what they see. I've thought about that illustration a number of times. Um, and in my thinking, I thought of Paul going down the Damascus Road, and he has persecuted the church and particularly persecuted Christ. And he was thrown from his horse and made blind by that incident. And in that chapter, we are told that when Ananias put his hands upon Paul, something very interesting happened. That's Acts 9.18. Something like scales fell from his eyes. Now, I have no idea what that could possibly be, whether that was literal or that was figurative. But the point is, he could see. Now he can see. My friends, you cannot possibly see reality if you're not a Christian. The world is all red. It's all one color. God will give you the eyes to see things as they really are. This demented soul can never see anyone properly because he is so consumed with himself. And so, he argues on, verse 31, For as long as the son of Jesse lives in the land, 
Look at this. You and your. Why, you can take those two words, you and your. You can throw those over your shoulder and walk away. <laughs> How ridiculous. Saul's not thinking about Jonathan and his future kingdom, you and your. Your kingship will not be established. We know that word established. It's uh, Psalm 11, verse 2. It's where the arrow meets the string and it's locked and fit in place. That's the word. But you and you are really. Let me show you why Saul is not thinking straight. See this phrase, in the land? It's literally on the land. And that phrase actually occurs in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 40. And it's a reference to the real estate that God in His grace and mercy gave to the people of Israel. He gave them the land. So as we become Christians, we realize something. Paul stabs us awake to the fact. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, what do you have that you have not received? Look how we live. I'm superior to you because I'm smarter. I'm superior to you because I have more money. I am superior to you because I am this or I am that. But not in the Christian mind. The Christian mind takes all of that away and recognizes that God in His sovereign grace and in His providence has given us everything, everything that we are. How could we be anything but grateful and humble and thankful. But make no mistake, here, you and your kingship, Saul is talking about himself. And notice his argument. As long as David is alive and well, why, everything is disjointed. Everything's out of place. Uneven. Not set. That's established. Jonathan, you've got to start thinking like a man thinks. Self-interest. Preservation. What he owns and what he has. That's the way men think. I own this. I own that. It's property. It's mammon. But you see, my friends, when a man has found his king, all of that goes away. Because he's found the great pearl of all of life. And everything is subservient to that. You cannot reason with a man who has found the king. Because this life in all of the collection that you would have and own in this life is subservient to that. The king. In my mind, the greatest statement that was ever uttered by a human being came from John the baptizer. He must increase, I must decrease. John 3.30 Verse 32, his response to his father. Why should he be dead? What did he do? Same words that David used in verse 1. I want you to see that without hesitation, wickedness is challenged right here. That's our Lord Jesus. Peter had just declared Him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's you. That's who you are. And Christ had paid Him a compliment 
to that. Flesh and blood has not taught you that, but my Father, the Spirit of God, has informed you of that amazing truth. And then he talks about his death and his suffering and what he must undergo. And Peter says, may it never be. And Christ turned on that in a moment. Get behind me, Satan. For you are talking about the things of men and I'm talking about the will of God. There's a hairline trigger to our Lord regarding the will of God. That is more important than anything else. Wickedness is challenged instantly. That's a powerful spiritual man. And notice, notice two questions. New, two questions. It's just four words in the inspired language. What could he have done? What I want you to see is Saul's response. You see it right there? No, you don't. Because he doesn't give one. And it makes me think of a passage in Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. Our Lord saying, you know, when you are delivered up to kings and magistrates and judges and rulers, don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't worry. You don't have to cram a bunch of clever arguments into your mind. I will give you the words at the time that it happens. Whether it's in the middle of the night, you're dragged from your house, or whatever the circumstance, the providence that God brings about. I will put those words in your mouth. This response is a godly response, and Saul has no answer for it. That's the point. What has David done? <laughs> He's been exemplary. And so, verse 33, the only response Saul could give is a flit of anger. He cast the spear toward Jonathan to strike him. In 1810, with a spear in his hand, and in 20 and verse 19, with a spear in his hand, he had thrown that spear at David. And now he throws that spear in his hand at his own son, Jonathan. The instability of this man. One minute, verse 31, he is... David's the enemy. And Saul is trying to protect Jonathan from this interloper. And the next thing you know, he's trying to kill him. He's irrational. He's self-contradictory. You ever talk to a man that's destroying his marriage in an affair? You try to talk to him, and he's a mass of contradictions. That's wickedness. You're not thinking straight. That's what wickedness and evil does to the mind. You're falling all over yourself. Nothing is making sense. You're irrational. Why did he throw the spear? I'll tell you why. Because in that moment, in that flash, he saw that Jonathan is just one like David. Those men get the spear. They are gone from my life. And so that tells you about this imaginary you and your kingdom 
that he's trying to protect for Jonathan. No, it's, it's all about you, Saul. This is you. Your, your name is on the side of the building. Your name is on the head of the stationery. You're, it's all about you. Under your terms, under your conditions, and if people must perish, then so be it. That's all. What did the people say? 1 Samuel 8, 5, Give us a king to rule over us. Well, you've got him. He's just like every other king in the world. Hardened ruler who rules with tyrannic authority. My friends, anything that you would desire or hope for that's a substitute for the living God. Oh, if I just had this. If I just had this property. If I just lived in this neighborhood. If I just belonged to this club. If I just had this, I would be happy. You are playing a game of foolishness that you do not understand. This life of Christ reproduced in the believer by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God is peace. Is peace. And your heart is restless until you rest in Him. Verse 34, Jonathan stood up from the table with anger. Jonathan is the same man in private that he is in public. He's the same man when he was all alone in a field with David as he is now in front of Saul and the cadre of leaders at his table. Public or private, he is the same man. What a magnificent person. He doesn't go along to get along for the moment. Verses 35 through 42, we have the outcome of the new moon feast. The message needed to be communicated to David. So, as planned, the prearranged code sent by arrows and the direction signaled to David. Verse 36, Jonathan shoots the arrow while. The boy is running. And uh, their plan was to shoot three arrows, but only one is mentioned in the text. Because really the arrows are not important, nor is the communication vital. Here is the scene that the Spirit of God wants us to draw to. It is the commitment between two people, David and Jonathan. Jonathan, the son of the king, by testimony, he welcomes David's future rule and reign. He's found his king. And all of the wealth and trappings of being the first in line to the kingdom means nothing to him. This is the regenerative life. Suddenly all those things that you thought were so important to have mean nothing compared to finding your king and desiring his rule and reign. Does He rule and reign over you? Then you have no peace. 
until he does. Verse 41. I want you to see David continues to act as Jonathan's subordinate, bowing his face to the ground three times. Why should that surprise us? He has all the power of the kingship. He has been anointed the prophet by the prophet of the living God, Samuel himself. And yet he subordinates himself below Jonathan. Why? Why would he do that? Because he is like his own son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to serve and not to be served. Notice the term each other. The inspired language repeats it twice. The expression means a man, or it could mean a friend, or it could mean a neighbor. In my mind, I take it to be a neighbor. And why? Because I think it is the writer's way of, again, tying back 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 28 to the story of David. Samuel telling Saul that the kingdom that you now own and possess and rightly rule will be removed from you and given to a, here's your word, same word, neighbor. A neighbor of yours who is better than than you. The kiss mentioned here. It's simply understood by the context. Strong emotions between two friends. Kisses will appear throughout the story of David. Unfortunately, they are beyond the scope of our study, which ends in 2 Samuel 5, when all the Tribes come together and make David king. But let's make a note here. The kiss in the ancient Near East, and particularly in Israel, is an expression of love, affection, but also an expression of submission. A sign of acknowledgement, if you will. Remember that the next time you read Psalm 2 and verse 12. Because the nations and the kings of the earth that are raging against the Lord are commanded in Psalm 2 and verse 12 to kiss, same word, kiss the Son. Subordinate yourself under the Son because He is the one who is going to rule and reign over all the nations. And if you oppose him, he will shatter you. Because he no longer comes on a colt. He will come on a white steed with power. And long for that day, Lord Jesus. Finally, observe weeping here. It's a farewell between two covenant friends. I emphasize the covenant. They believe the same things. They're, they're interlocked one with another. And these two friends are emotional over the providence that makes them depart. And their departure even necessary. Why, think about it. They could have fought together. They could have made war against the Philistines together. David, you go this way, I'll go that way. We'll, we'll attack them from both sides. All of those grand plans that would never be. All because of the hostility of a demented man who thinks he can keep it all. 
to himself. What does Saul want? <laughs> he wants it all. That's what he wants. And you are not going to have it. Here's the close. And the key phrase shall be between you and me forever. You know, that's a level of spiritual maturity that few people ever attain to, unfortunately. But I think of weeping. I always think of Acts 20, 28, of uh, the weeping of the Ephesian elders with the departure of Paul after he had been there together and they served together. When you believe the same things, you have a, a unique fellowship. You have a, a binding one to another that this world just simply does not understand or cannot understand. I had a good friend of mine die a few years back, a very close to, and I kept telling him as the Parkinson's disease continued to roar on in his body, I'm not going to cry at your funeral. I'm not going to weep at you leaving this life because you're going to have it so much better than me. It's going to be my loss, but your gain. Now, last time we were together, we prayed, and he could barely be heard. That disease had taken away his voice. And I prayed, and we left. And I got in the car, and I wept. You see, to be in Christ is a different kind of life altogether. If you're not in Christ, you don't know this life. But it is a life within this life that binds you together with others and makes people so special. People are special because they're going to go on and on and on. My friends, if you don't have that relationship with Christ, you don't know what I'm talking about. But I'm going to give you the opportunity right now to place your trust in Him and see the scales fall from your eyes. The rose-colored glasses disappear and you're going to see as you've never seen before. May God give you the grace. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for this Your eternal Word. And may this Word, wherever it goes, however it goes in Your providence, reach the hearts and minds of anyone right now who does not know You. And would You open that heart? Would You open that mind? Would You drop the scales from their eyes that they may know that they have found what they've always been searching for in the midst of their wealth and their desire for this and that, they have found the King. And He is the righteousness of God, the man Jesus Christ. Would you do that, Lord, before Your Word today? In Jesus' name, Amen.